Oh, they, it was a call. It was a couple of calls, and they didn't follow up on the call, mm. and they admitted to, to it. And, and, and a lot of guys. And they said yeah. they made changes. I didn't find out what exactly happened to the uh, the, the police or the the FBI agents that didn't follow up. And, and a lot of the times, it's it's the same mo. It, it's someone who's socially isolated, someone who hurts themselves and hurts other people around them, someone who clearly is a threat, someone who even goes online and says, "I'm going to be committing these threats," and that also falls through the cracks. I mean, there's just so many of these. Instances. I have the lady that called the threat into the FBI that calls me like constantly. You know, not constantly. Every few months, she checks in with me because she just feels horrible. Yeah, that she called and warned them. And they never followed up on it. She was someone that knew the guy personally? Yeah, it was like an aunt, oh. a distant aunt that knew he was, uh, you know, talking about being a school shooter. And she had called the FBI and the police department, and they didn't follow up correctly. And the rest, you know, we know what happened. Yeah, she must feel she yeah, probably yeah, she horrible. She probably me. feels so much guilt yep. uh, because she knew something was going to happen. She tried to warn the authorities, and then, then they just sat on their hands, didn't do and anything. And you know, we... Uh, you guys don't follow it as much as I do. We just had that trial. He just, and after murdering 17 people, uh, he still wasn't committed. He didn't get the death penalty, life without parole. You know, he's always killed 17 people, innocent, on video, admitted to it, and didn't get the death penalty. Why so no, it's ridiculous. Why no death penalty? Uh, a couple, it was like one or two people voted against the death penalty in the jury. So we're trying to fix that. I've been I spoke with Governor DeSantis about it. There's a way around it where you you don't need a full majority. Uh, it could be less. It could be like seventy percent. Because it was ridiculous. What does a person need to do in society to get the death penalty if this thing didn't get it? Did you, you kill my daughter? Would you support the death penalty before the shooting? Well, I have a I personally have a problem with the way the death penalty works because the average death row inmate sits there for 20 years before they're executed peacefully. So I think there could be a lot of changes to it. It should be expedited. You know, someone commits a, a heinous crime like that, it should, shouldn't take more than six months, you know, to have a trial and execute them. Then I would be all for the death penalty. But the way it's set up now with appeals and they get their own... Uh, I looked into it. So a death row inmate doesn't have to work when he's in prison. He doesn't have to get his meals. It's brought to him. He gets his own TV. He gets his own security detail. So death row, uh, a lot of people after a few years of being in general population are actually praying to be on death row. That's what I'm hoping happens to my daughter's killer. All of them on death row are getting fed meals and they br care? they're brought to the the meals are brought to them. What you know by the correction officers. They don't have to go on a line. They don't have to go on a general population. Uh, they they have their own security detail, their own TV, their own uh, computer, and they just sit. Most of them, it's over 20 years. We talk about the ethics of the death penalty on the show from time to time. I'm kind of, it's, uh, it's interesting because I'm like pro-choice, but yep. pro-death penalty. Maybe I'm just a killer. I, I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all killers in a way, but I would be more for it if it was under 20 years, you know, to sit 20 years in a cell and it's cost, you know, Broward County where he was housed, it cost the county $4 million just keeping oh, wow. him in the yeah. prison system awaiting trial. In Canada, they uh, banned uh, the death penalty, but they, they're expanding their uh, euthanasia efforts very aggressively, which is absolutely mind-boggling and, and absolutely totally backwards, in my opinion. But if you don't mind telling us about this, uh, the, a little bit more details about this FBI story, because, again, it's either they miss it or they're either trying to find someone who's mentally ill and goading them into doing something, as there's also a lot of documented stories of people coming together saying, hey, I had a mentally ill child, the FBI worked undercover and tried to push them to be extremists. There's a lot of those stories as well. But what did, what did this woman, do you have some of the details here? I know you don't have a lot of the notes in front of you, but but there was two warnings. Um, one was uh, from like a chat room. The first one came from someone in a chat room to the FBI. And the other one was from like a, an aunt of his calling the FBI wow. that he was going to be a school shooter. Wow. And they failed both, uh, you know, both Holy of them cow. they didn't follow up. Yeah. Uh, the police and the sheriff's department didn't follow up mm. either. What, what's pretty bad is there was this guy, Deputy Eason, his name was. I, I remember these names. He got a called to follow up that he was going to be the school shooter. He doesn't go and follow up on the tip, right? So, of course, he was able to go and kill my daughter that day. But he's also one of the deputies that 
went to the school and didn't go in the building. Mm. That, that, wow. You know, so he wow. failed miserably not following up the lead. And then he goes to the high school and lets kids get killed inside a building. Just and like doesn't go in with a gun and a vest. He sits outside. Just like Uvalde. Uh, same, and, very and, and, similar and, and situation. And again, the same kind of stories. Officers outside. This is so like, frustrating and so heartbreaking to hear all it, the time. Officers standing outside. Not, it really not, not going affected in. me big time with Uvalde because I, I was so, after the Parkland shooting, I got so involved with law enforcement and we made such a stink out of that there was just the one deputy at the school his name was deputy peterson scott he didn't go in that day he hid for 45 minutes he didn't hide he was right by the he went within eight feet of the door he heard the ar shots going off i know all this from uh depositions we did he heard the ar shots going off and he went to reach and then he heard it he retreated and then he hid behind uh he stood by a wall for 45 minutes uh why he heard the gunshots going off so he is, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but he is being held on felony uh, child endangerment charges. Wow. I'll be at his trial, it'll be in May. Wow. But after Parkland, it was, there was so much media attention on these cops not going in, and I did so much press that I thought there's no way in the world what, could a cop not know if you hear gunshots that you gotta move towards the gunfire. And then Uvalde happened, and it really killed me, man. My son had issues, you know, with, with the anxiety, and it was just horrible after Uvalde that these guys, I don't know if you noticed, they didn't even go to open the door in Uvalde. You know, it wasn't locked. Yep. That was all BS. They created a perimeter yeah, door blocking parents, pushing yeah. parents out so they couldn't stop the shooting. Yep. There was parents that, had to, that were arrested that had to run away and then get in the building and then get their children before the cops did in Uvalde, which is infuriating. And, there's, and, and I remember carving Parkland and, and, and reading about it and being like, what were these cops thinking? They're armed. Kids there's a number killed. of them. They're inside of a school. Their main job is to, is to, you know, as they say, protect and serve. Their main job is to run into the line of... Uh, 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 like a fire when it comes to yep. safeguarding the most innocent, the most smallest, the most purest, you know, children of our society. And then they, they, they just children stand getting there. Killed. What was that? Uh, that, that uh, we were talking about, I think earlier this week, how in China, if someone's driving a car and they accidentally run someone over, they'll get out of the car and then murder the person because having to be financially responsible for a person for life is worse than getting a few years in prison for an accidental, like you know, vehicular assault or whatever. When th there was there was another another story, people uh, I, I can't remember who brought it up about uh, what they do in China in a similar fashion. But when you get to a point where your society is over overly litigious and lacking any kind of social cohesion, these are the stories we start to see. The reason why the cops in Uvalde bar parents from going in. I don't want to get sued. If they go in there and cause a problem, they're going to say, why didn't the police stop them from going in? And then we get sued and then I lose my job. No, you're not allowed to go in. I'm not going to go in either. You want me to risk my life for your kid? Never going to happen. That's where we're at right now. People don't look at each other and say, we're all in this together. They look at it and say, every man for himself. Was that the vibe you got? I'm not that you know the intentions of the officers on duty at the time, but did you get the vibe that they didn't want to get legal recourse or were they just afraid or... Uh, they were just, uh, there's an expression in law enforcement, it's called ROD, retired on duty. Mm -hmm. Parkland's listed as one of the safest cities in the state. So they just had cushy jobs, overweight cops, you know, uh, they didn't run in where anyone, the coaches, there were coaches at the school that ran in that day unarmed. And so Deputy Peterson now, he's getting 110000 a year pension for letting my daughter get murdered and those other 16 people. So I'm hoping I'll be at that trial in May in Broward, and I'm hoping if he's found guilty of felony charges, uh, he'll lose his pension. He went, it was great, it was unbelievable. We had, we deposed him, you know, and I was sitting as close as I am to Tim with this guy, and he came in holding a Bible, you know? He thinks mm -hmm. he's gonna, God's gonna help him now that he let all those people die. It's nice to hear that you said the coaches actually ran in that day because, yep. you know, I'm actually a, a high school coach myself and they tell you, cool. you can't, like if there's fights, you can't touch the kids. Like Tim was saying, like out of fear of lawsuits. So I'm glad the, the coaches of Parkland actually had the, they the guts went in, to go in and go. And his name was uh, Aaron Feiss. And they actually named a really good program after him in, in Florida. It's called the Aaron Feiss Guardian Program where teachers or not law enforcement could go through this program and be able to carry on, on at cool. the schools. 
and I, I, I sat through it. It's really intense. Yeah. And there's different districts that are allowing it, and they named it in the bill that we got passed in Florida, the Aaron Feist Guardian Program. Oh. Aaron died shielding. I'm reading about it. Yep. What what was it happened exactly? Oh, he got it. He went into the building, uh, and it was just horrible timing. When exactly when he opened the door, he was he just blown away with the guy, with the the shooter. My daughter actually was uh, on the ninth floor. She was uh, shot nine times, and she mm. was shielded. She shielded another uh, student, and actually at point blank range, he shot her, and the bullets went through her and uh, it killed the other girl too. So for forty five minutes to an hour, the police were sitting outside. Forty five minutes, while one guy with an AR, while multiple weapons, was walking around the school. One AR that he had an AR. The Peterson, the deputy that was there, could have had a clear shot at him. Uh, he he went to the door. The shooter was still on the first floor. People, a lot of people don't know the shooter went to the school in an Uber, if you could believe it, with a Cabela's rifle bag. She picked him up at his house, the Uber driver, drove him to the school with his rifle bag where he got out and walked right in through an open gate where the gate was, in a, it was against protocol. The gate should have been locked, you know, that and, you know, people didn't call the code red. People hidden adults hadn't hidden, hidden closets, didn't, you know, didn't call a code red. Police hit. It was like so many things that went wrong against my daughter that day that I could make a list. What if, just what if, if certain things would have happened, she'd be alive today. Do, or, do they have gun-free zones in these in, in these places? I think every school's like yeah. most of them. Because I'm wondering about an Uber driver seeing someone come with a rifle bag and being like, "Oh, a school," you say, "Huh?" and driving them into this place where there's, you know, I guess my view of it is the law gun-free zone is 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 it is meaningless. Oh, well, the people, criminals don't follow gun-free zones. But, but even Uber drivers don't understand. Yep. You know, they're, they're, they will pick up a person with a gun and drive them a, right into it. Yeah, with a rifle bag, carried yeah. it with a Cabela's rifle bag right into the school and doesn't never said anything. They thought it was normal to pick up a kid before school hours. No one's even there. You know, it was just one of the things that went against my daughter that day. Thanks for watching this clip from the TimCast IRL podcast. Hang out with us live Monday through Friday at 8 p.m., and become a member over at TimCast.com for uncensored, members-only shows exclusive. Thanks for hanging out, and we'll see you all next time.